الله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبي إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا أيها الكافرون لا أعبد ما تعبدون ولا أنتم عابدون ما أعبد ولا أنا عابد ما عبدتم ولا أنتم عابدون ما أعبد لكم دينكم واليا دين Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Surah number 109, which is Surah Al-Kafirun, is one of the four surahs towards the end of the Qur'an that begin with the Qul. There are four surahs that are known as the Qul surahs. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas, Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq, and Qul ya ayyuh al-Kafirun. <coughs> and this is one of the shorter surahs in the Qur'an, because it's in the end of the Qur'an. And it is a surah that addresses a very important issue which was important at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and it is relevant even until today. And that is the pressures that the Muslims used to face and continue to face until today. The pressures that the Muslims were facing during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and the pressures that Rasulullah he himself was facing to let go of his religion and accept the religion and the faith of the idol worshippers. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was put under immense pressure to let go of his values, to let go of his beliefs. And we see that this is a challenge that is common until today. Many Muslims today, you see that the greatest challenge, especially Muslims that are living in the West, especially Muslims that are living in predominantly non-Muslim countries, one of the greatest challenges they have is as soon as they step foot out of the house, they find that they have to appease to others. They have to sacrifice and let go of their own beliefs and their own values and principles in order to please others. This was something that was very common during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa where many of the early Muslims, they were subjected to this type of pressure where they couldn't practice, they didn't have the freedom to practice their faith. And we see that this goes on until today. Right now you go and you see in some secular countries, like France for example. Right now France, they're imposing a law upon people to let go of Islam. Now recently they're passing a law or they've already passed a law saying that you're not allowed to sell and distribute halal meat in France. Or ladies cannot wear hijab if they're under 18. And what the irony here is that the age of sexual consent in France is 15. So after the age of 15, people are free to make their own decisions with regards to their own sexuality. However, they're, not old, they're old enough to make, to make decisions regarding their sexuality, but until the age of 18, a lady, she, can't, she doesn't have the right to make her own decisions because she might be pressured by her family. So here's the irony that we see and... We see that France, which is claiming to be a secular country, it's imposing its own form of secularism. This type of pressure that is displayed towards Muslims, we see it's also displayed towards other religious groups as well. And Muslims have been facing this and dealing with this for a very long time. Surah Al-Kafirun, it comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi to draw the line and say that when it comes to your faith, when it comes to your belief, there's no compromises. You can't compromise, you can't change your beliefs for someone else. Now, you could be tolerant of someone, you could be loving, you could be, you could coexist with other people, but you can't change your beliefs. You can't change your identity for someone else's satisfaction. So, <clears throat> when Rasulullah was in Mecca, the pressure 
against the Prophet was very severe. And this is why Surah, uh, surah Al-Kafirun, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ It's a Meccan surah. It was revealed in Mecca, telling the Prophet what to tell the non-believers when they are pressuring him to let go of his faith and let go of his values and let go of his uh, beliefs. Now today, some people, they come and they say, you know what, it doesn't matter what you're worshipping. And let us, I worship, you worship, who cares what we're worshipping? Let's just get along. My dear brothers and sisters, your worship is your, what you worship is your identity, it's your beliefs, it's your values. And it does matter. So don't come and tell me, let go of my values, let go of my teachings, let go of my principles. And this is a very important issue. But today we find some people, they come and they say, yeah, you don't need to worship. Who cares? Just live and do whatever you can. No, worshiping, that is a part of my identity. The Lord that I worship, that, that chooses my character, my values, my principles are all decided through what we worship and what we cherish in life. So before going into the details of the surah, I'm going to mention some of the ahadith, some of the narrations that talk about the merits and the reward of reciting Surah Al-Kafirun. In a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi he says, مَنْ قَرَأَ قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ فَكَأَنَّمَا قَرَأَ رُبْعَ الْقُرْآنَ The one who recites قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ the surah, it's as if the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give this person the reward of the one who has recited one-fourth of the Qur'an. It's as if you have recited one-fourth of the Qur'an. وَتَبَاعَدَتْ عَنْهُ مَرَدَتِ الشَّيَاطِينَ And the evils of the shayateen, satans, will be far away from this person. وَبَرِئَ مِنَ الشِّرْكِ And this person will be purified and protected from shirk, from idol worship. وَيُعَافَ مِنَ الْفَزَعِ الْأَكْبَرِ And this person will be safe from the ultimate fear. And that is the fear on the Day of Judgment. The fear of, you know, being tested and <coughs> judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a great fear. الْفَزَعِ الْأَكْبَرِ This person will be safe from that. Because this person, the surah is teaching you to declare your faith and declare your identity and tell, the, tell others who do not believe in what you believe in, no. You don't believe in what I believe in. You could be, you could believe in whatever you want. But don't come and pressure me. Don't come and take away my values. I am holding on to my religion. I don't worship what you worship. And you don't worship what I worship. In another hadith, a man comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, And he tells him, جِئْتَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لِتُعَلِّمَنِي شَيْئًا أَقُولَهُ عَنْدَ مَنَامِي Ya Rasulullah, I came to ask you for something that I should say right before I sleep. Before I sleep, what should I say? Something that protects me, something that will keep me rested, something that will keep me as a faithful person, as a mu'min. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa tells him, إِذَا أَخَذْتَ مَضْجَعَكْ فَقْرَأْ قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ ثُمَّ نَمْ عَلَىٰ خَاتِمَتِهَا فَإِنَّهَا بَرَاءَ مِنَ الشِّرْكِ Recite, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ <coughs> And then sleep, because this will protect you from shirk. Now, why is it important to recite Qur'an, to say the Shahada, to recite Ayatul Kursi, to recite Surah Al-Kafirun before you sleep? You know, this is something that we should, kind of, we should remind ourselves. Let the last word that you say before you fall asleep is Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, or recite Surah Al-Tawheed, or recite Ayatul Kursi, or say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. According to this hadith, recite Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun. Why? Because there is no guarantee there's no guarantee whatsoever that I'm going to wake up from my sleep. And there are verses in the Quran and narrations that say when a person sleeps, this is similar to death. Sleep is really close to death. When you're sleeping, who, what, what guarantee do you have that you're going to wake up? So a mu'min is the one who does not have that long hope in life. You don't, you're not supposed to have that long hope that you're going to live forever. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi one day asked Abu Dhar, how much hope do you have in this dunya? How much hope do you have in this life? Abu Dhar, he said, I don't have hope when I sleep. I don't have hope that I will wake up. I don't really know. I don't have any guarantee. And when I wake up, I don't really guarantee and I don't have hope that I'm going to stay awake and stay and stay alive until nighttime. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, subhanallah. See, Abu Dhar, this man has, you know, 
right, and according to our standards, oh wow, this man is really looking forward, you know, to meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he doesn't have hope in this dunya. Rasulullah when he heard him, he said, Your hope is so long, O oh Abu Dhar. Abu Dhar said, How? Rasulullah tells him, As for me, when I blink my eye, I don't have hope that I will oh wait, that I will open it. And when I open it, I don't know, I don't have any guarantee that I will be able to close it. Because some people, Rasulullah tells people, you see people when they die, some people they die with their eyes open, other people they die with their eyes closed. Why? Because they didn't have time to open or close their eyes. There was no guarantee whatsoever. So when you sleep, before you sleep, you, what guarantee do we have that we're going to wake up from our sleep? So many people, they go to sleep and they don't wake up. So recite this before you sleep and recite Surah Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun. Now, this Surah was revealed. What's the story of the revelation? Sabab al Nuzul. This story, this Surah was revealed when some of the heads of Quraysh, some of the heads of the Kuffar, of the pagans in Mecca, they came to pressure Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They come to him, Al Harith ibn Qais, Al Sahami, Wal As ibn Wa'il, Wal Walid ibn Al Mughira, Wa Umayya ibn Khalaf. These four individuals, <coughs> they come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and they tell him, Oh Muhammad, you know you're a good person, you're truthful, we know that you're a good person. But right now you're coming and you're bringing this religion, it's shaking our whole social system, and we believe in these idols, and we're making money out of these, and Mecca business, people come, we sell them idols, they buy food and they have to put it in front of the idols. This is going to change our whole life. Why don't you stop? You worship our gods one year, the next year we worship your gods. If we saw that it was making sense, we will stay on yours. If you saw that our gods didn't hurt you and you were living a comfortable life, then you continue worshiping our gods, our idols. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, they, they told him, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he tells them, I seek refuge in Allah from what you are telling me. A'udhu billah mimma taqulun. I seek refuge in Allah from what you are saying. Now, According to today's standards, this is probably, you find a lot of people, they'll come and they'll tell you, yeah, you know, don't, you don't have to be a Muslim. You go and practice what other people are practicing. One day we'll practice what you're practicing. Let's all get along and coexist with one another. However, when it comes to values, when it comes to faith, you can't do that because that's your faith. That's your identity. You can't let go of what you believe in. So they kept insisting. They would come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and they would keep telling him, they would keep telling him. The pressures against the Prophet didn't immediately start with violence and with force and with aggression and sanctions. No, first they were just talking to the Prophet. They were offering, they were offering money, they were offering, you know, so many things to Rasulullah to just let go. They were talking, to, first they started talking to him, then they started offering, then they started threatening, and then it turned to violence. So they kept insisting until Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi goes to Masjid al-Haram and this surah, Surah al-Kafirun was revealed upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So they're all sitting in Masjid al-Haram. They have just given him an offer and he keeps telling them no, no, no. Then he tells them I will, I'm going to wait for my Lord, for my Lord to tell me what to say. Then this surah is revealed. He goes to Masjid al-Haram and he recites Surah Qul Ya Ayyuha al-Kafirun. After he recited this, they realized that no, this man is not compromising. Because this surah is a very clear indica indicator that the Prophet is not going to change. Tell the kuffar, I don't worship what you worship. And you don't worship what I worship. And I will not in the future worship what you worship. And I will not in the future so don't even come and try to force me. Worship what you worship. وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَبْدُونَ مَا عَبْدُ And you will even come and worship what I worship. لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ You have your religion and I have mine. So once the surah was revealed, they realized that no, this man, he's holding on to his values and therefore the pressure, the violence and the sanctions began and the harassment began against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So let's look at it verse by verse. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ Say, O oh disbelievers. Kafir means disbeliever. Someone who, who does not appreciate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone who does not believe. This person is 
a kafir. This person is kafir, someone who's rejecting, rejecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ And they're called kafir because they reject God, so therefore they're, they're called kafir. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ Say, O oh disbelievers, لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ I do not worship what you worship. You worship these idols. Don't come and force these idols upon me. You have your own beliefs. You have your own values. Don't come and try to pressure me. Don't try to pressure it on me. وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ And you don't worship what I worship. وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدٌ مَا عَبَدْتُمْ Nor will I be a worshipper of what you worship, even in the future. وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ Nor will you be worshippers of what I worship. And these individuals, not now this is not, you don't tell that to every kafir. وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ Because there were some that actually ended up believing in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But these several individuals that we mentioned their names, um, Al Harith ibn Qais al Sahami, Al Asa ibn Wa'il, Al Walid ibn Al Mughira, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, they died on the kufr. So this is why the Quran is foretelling the future. Wala antum abiduna ma'abud. Even later on, you're not going to worship what I worship. Lakum dinakum waliyadin. For you is your religion, and for me is my religion. So this surah is a reminder, my dear brothers and sisters, for the Muslims to hold on to our faith, to hold on to our values. Many Muslims, and it's very unfortunate, they're just, you know, Muslims by name, but they're willing to do whatever it takes to please other people. If someone is uncomfortable with me praying, I'm not going to pray. If someone's uncomfortable with the hijab, I'm going to not wear the hijab. If someone's uncomfortable with me eating halal meat, I'm going to, you know, eat the haram meat. Someone's uncomfortable with my name, someone's uncomfortable. What's left if you're going to keep giving away everything? You know, some people, especially in times of fear, I remember... After 9-11, you see some Muslims, no, 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 don't, don't pray in public, don't do this, don't change your name, do this and do that so that you don't, so that you know you protect yourself. But if you're just going to keep giving up, giving up and shaving away from your own identity and your values, what's going to be left? What's going to be left? What's the purpose of living if we're giving up all of our identity? You want to hold on something. This religion, my dear brothers and sisters, this religion was passed on to us or if you were if you took it with conviction then you took it with conviction if you believe in it because you're convinced in it and that's the way it should be then hold on to it hold on to what you believe yes we're not supposed to insult other people we're not supposed to hurt other people and make other people uncomfortable but we're supposed to hold on to our identity be strong be firm be as be a strong mu'min, a strong believer. Be proud of your religion. Be proud of your faith, of your teachings and your values. This is not to say that we should, you know, insult and abuse and hurt others. No, leave others. Let them do whatever they want to do. Let them do what they want to do. Lakum dinakum waliyadin. But tell them, don't come and mess with my religion. And this is this is a major challenge we see Muslims doing today. Not necessarily with God. Muslims will say, no, I still believe in God. I'm not going to worship an idol. But when it comes to other issues, when it comes to certain lifestyle choices, when it comes to certain immoral <coughs> acts, for example, right now, there are some immoral things that are you know, pushed on us. And through the media, through m movies, in the universities, in schools, trying to indoctrinate people to accept certain immoral things. We need to come and say, no, this is something I don't believe in. This is something that goes against my beliefs. These are things that go against my teachings and my values. Right now, they're, they're you know, imposing on people to accept, you know, there's no genders. One day you want to be, one day you want to be with a husband, with a man. One day you want to be with a woman. One day you want to go back and forth. You want to do these things, or you, you, one day you, you want to tell tell people you're a guy. The next day you want to tell people you're a lady. The third day you come back, and these are things that go against common sense and go against morality. Yes, if there are people who have their own issues, their own mental health issues, their own their own personal issues, leave them, let them be. But don't come and force your teachings and your values on me because I have my own values, I have my own religion. I can't as a Muslim come and support 
a movement that goes against my values and we see many Muslims doing that they they're now to see there's a difference between going out and fully supporting something that's immoral and for being quiet and saying I defend a person for their humanity I defend a person for them being a human yes we defend people for their humanity but we don't defend the immoral acts of people or for example right now you know some things that have become legal for example marijuana there are some Muslims today they come and they say yeah you know since it became legal then therefore that means we should go and do it we should go and sell it we should go and recreational marijuana and this scholars they say it's haram scholars say there's a problem with this because it's intoxicating you it's taking away from your it's taking away from your aql so just because something is going on in society you know people are doing it that doesn't necessarily make it right and we as Muslims, we need to have a firm stand and we need to be, stand and st strand, stand strong, defend your faith and defend your values. But when Muslims, they start giving in, when Muslims, they start saying, okay, you know what, for the sake of unity, for the sake of this, for the sake of tolerance, I'm going to let go of my values, then this creates confusion. Then people don't know where the real Islam is and where it's mixed with others. So, we should not compromise our values. The dearest thing that you have to you is your faith and your values and your religion. If we slowly give up our, our values, then nothing will remain. And the Qur'an teaches us to hold on to our values. The Qur'an comes as a support to the Muslims. لا أعبد ما تعبدون ولا أنتم عبدون ما أعبد. I don't worship what you worship. I don't believe in your values and you don't believe in mine. So we could be at peace with one another. But don't force your teachings on me. Like the way, for example, France is trying to impose its secular beliefs on other people. A lady is allowed to wear a scarf for the purpose of, you know, design and nice and being a model, she's wearing it. But if she's wearing it for the purpose of religion, she's not allowed to. So here you see the double standards trying to force their colonial beliefs and, and, and force their secular beliefs upon other people. And this is something that Islam says, no, as a Muslim, you have to be strong. You have to be, you have to be respectful to others, but at the same time, hold on to your own beliefs. Now, one question some people ask is, why is the qul mentioned? You know, in these four, qul huwa Allahu ahad, qul a'udhu bi nas, qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq, qul ya'ayuhu al-kafirun. Why is the qul mentioned? Some people... They have they, they come up with these weird theories. There's a theory out there that says that the Quran is not the words of God, but it's the words of Jibrail. This is one theory. Another theory says no, the Quran is not the words of God or the words of Jibrail. It's the word of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa So the Quran would come to the heart of Rasulullah, and Rasulullah would interpret the Quran in his own words and then he would read it to the people. So it's not the actual words that came. He it would basically come, he processes it and then he reads it in his own words to the people. But my dear brothers and sisters, we believe that the Quran, all of it from cover to cover is the actual words of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even Rasulullah, he did not change. Jibrail did not change. Jibrail is the Amin of the Wahi and Rasulullah is the Prophet. He delivered the Quran exactly as it was revealed. So if the Quran comes to the Prophet, if the revelation comes to the heart of the Prophet, Qul huwa Allahu Ahad, he says Qul huwa Allahu Ahad. He doesn't come out and say Allahu Ahad. Or Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun, he doesn't come out because Qul means say. The, the Rasulullah doesn't come out and say Ya ayyuhal kafirun. No, he says the Qul with it. The fact that he says the Qul with it means that this is how it was revealed upon Rasulullah. And he's even saying it the way, exactly, exactly the way he heard it. So this is a very important issue that the Qur'an is the actual word of God that was revealed on the heart of Rasulullah. And Rasulullah delivered it to us exactly the way he heard it. So if there's a Qul in it, Rasulullah, he, added, he said that Qul exactly as it came down. He didn't come out and say, Ya ayyuhal kafirun, O you disbelievers. He came out and said, Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun, exactly the way it came down to him. Rasulullah did not change. And even there's a verse, Qul ma yakunu li an ubaddilahu min tilqa'a nafsi in attabi' illa ma yuha'alayh. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, tells them, I can't change the Quran on my own. I follow exactly how it was revealed upon me, exactly how it came down to me. Another very important question is, why the repetition in the verses? You know, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا عَبُدُ وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدٌ مَا عَبَدْتُمْ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا عَبُدُ This is repeated twice. لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَلْيَدِينَ So, لا أعبد, I don't worship what you worship is repeated twice and you don't worship what I worship is repeated twice. So, one theory or one opinion scholars say is this is to say, you know what, I'm going to repeat this twice so that you don't even try. It's like someone coming and telling you, you know what, change your beliefs. You say, no, 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 I'm not changing my belief. I'm not changing my, you say it twice to make it sure, to reaffirm exactly what you said so that no one comes and says, oh, this person, maybe there's a chance this person is going to change their beliefs. No. لا أعبد ما أعبدون ولا أنتم عبدون ما أعبد ولا أنا عبد ما أعبدتم ولا So basically, I don't worship what you worship and you don't worship what I worship. Saying it twice to make it very clear that a Muslim does not go and worship idols and a Muslim should not let go of their values. In a hadith from one of the one of the atheists of the time of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, his name is Abu Shakir al-Daysani, Abu Shakir al-Daysani, and he was one of those who would debate with Imam Sadiq several times. He asks one of the Abu Shakir al-Daysani, he's a mulhid, he, he's an atheist, he asks one of the companions of Imam Sadiq by the name of Mu'min al-Taq, Mu'min al by the name of Mu'min al-Taq, his name is Muhammad ibn Ali al-Nu'mani, he asks him, why was the surah in Surah al kafirun why was it repeated it twice? Why was it repeated twice? And he tells him, a hakim person, a wise person doesn't say something more than once. You know, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَبْدُونَ مَا عَبْدُ وَلَا أَنَا عَبْدُ مَا عَبْدُتُمْ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَبْدُونَ مَا عَبْدُ You don't, typically people don't talk like that. So he's saying a wise person doesn't repeat things twice. So, Mu'min al-Taq, he didn't have an answer. So he goes all the way from Iraq to Medina to see Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. وَدَخَلَ عَلَى الْإِمَامِ الصَّادِقِ سَأَلَهُ عَنْ ذَلِكِ He goes and he asks Imam al-Sadiq. So Imam al-Sadiq, he says, this verse, he tells him exactly the story that we mentioned earlier. He says that the heads of Quraysh, they came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and they were insisting upon the Prophet. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ La abud. They were telling him, worship what we worship what we worship, and we will worship what you worship. So he tells them, La abudu ma taabudun, wa la antum abudun ma abud, and you don't worship what what I'm worshiping right now. Then they tell him, okay, in the future, worship what I what we are worshiping next year, and we will also in the future worship what you worship. He tells them again, wa la antum abudun ma abud, wa la ana abudum ma abudum. So. The verse was being revealed as a conversation with the people. They were, they were making one offer, the Qur'an comes and gives one statement. Then they made another offer, then the Qur'an comes and gives another statement. So this man, Mu'min al-Taq, he goes back to Abu Shakir al-Daysani and he informs him, he gives him the answer. So once he goes, Abu Shakir al-Daysani, he was an atheist, but he knew that Mu'min al-Taq was not the one who brought this answer. He tells him, هَذَا مَا حَمَلَهُ الْإِبِلْ مِنَ الْحِجَازِ He tells him, this is knowledge that was carried on the camel's back all the way from Hijaz, meaning that you went all the way to Imam al-Sadiq to get the answer for this. This is not something that, this is not your word, this is the word of Ja'far al-Sadiq. And and because he was happy with the answer, so he said, this is, this is the word of Ja'far al-Sadiq. So, my dear brothers and sisters, this surah is very clear, telling people to not let go of their values, not let go of their faith, and to hold firm to what they believe in. And my dear brothers and sisters, we have to be proud of our faith. We have to hold on to our faith and our beliefs and be proud of it. A lot of Muslims, I see that they're kind of insecure of their religion, insecure of their faith. They're always trying to appease others, always trying to make excuses. No, be proud of what you have. Be proud of your religion. This religion was passed down to you or you took it based on conviction. Be proud of it. 
والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وعلى آله الطاهرين نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات تابع اللهم بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك غافر الخطيئات إنك على كل شيء قدير وصلى الله على محمد وآل محمد